mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of APA and chair of the New Urbanism Division, and I'm your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, April 15th, not tax day, and we will hear the presentation utilizing public-private partnerships and funding to create local and regional innovation. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or you can call that bolded number shown. And for your content questions related to the presentation, you can type those in the questions box, also located in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. And we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Coming up on your screen is a list of uh, the chapters and divisions that are members with us this year. Thanks to all the participating members for making these webcasts possible and free to their members. Today's webcast is sponsored by the New Mexico chapter of APA. To learn more about them, you can visit apa-nm.org. And to learn more about all of our divisions, you can visit planning.org slash divisions. On your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. To register for these, visit our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, just head over to planning.org, log in your MyAPA account, <clears throat> and then scroll down to uh, the CM log section and select search for CM activities. And then in that search bar, you can type the event number for today or just the title of today's webcast. And you can find both of those at our webcast webpage, again, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And this webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. We do have a few recorded webcasts that are available for distance education. Um, one law, one ethics, they're both worth 1.5. So... For those of you that <clears throat> have uh, a CM reporting period that's uh, coming due at the end of May there, that can be helpful to you. So again, just go to ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast, and you'll see those two distance education sessions that are available for you. You can click on them to view them and then log them. And like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information on our upcoming sessions. And uh, we are recording today's webcast. It will be available on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast or go to youtube.com slash planning webcast. And uh, after the session ends, we'll also have a PDF available on our webcast webpage. Again, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Okay, with that, um, I am going to turn it over to today's speakers, specifically uh, Valerie Hermanson and Lola Bird. So I'm going to uh, switch my screens over to them, and we can get started. Valerie. Great. Thank you, Christine. Go ahead and load this PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Great. So good morning, or maybe good afternoon, depending on where you are. This is Valerie Hermanson, and I'm a transportation planner with the Mid-Region Council of Governments. And um, hello, my name is Lola Bird, and I am the director of a downtown economic development organization called the Downtown Main Street Program. Okay, and we're here today to talk to you about our pilot bike share, which we lovingly dubbed BC, which is short for the Spanish word for bicicleta. Um, bicycle. And here's a photo of Lola and I at our press conference when we announced the program, just to give you an idea of who we are and what we look like. Okay, go ahead and get started. So it's, it's kind of interesting to give a presentation for a national perspective um, and, you know, 
usually when we give this, it's local, so people know exactly where Albuquerque is and know exactly where downtown is. So it's kind of fun to dial it back a little bit um, and and express and show and demonstrate all of the great work that we're doing here in Albuquerque. So uh, hopefully you realize Albuquerque is part of the United States. I've definitely been to other states and told people I'm from New Mexico and they thought I was from Mexico. But Albuquerque is centered in New Mexico, which is one of the four corner states. Maybe if you're quite not, not quite sure about where Albuquerque is, think to Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad is filmed here in Albuquerque. It's a great show, um, but it's definitely given an interesting spin on Albuquerque. So we're excited to present today other perspectives of what Albuquerque can be and is growing to be. A little background about Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, we're about half a million people, but our population is projected to grow to 1.3 million in our region by 2040. Um, we're a bit of a sprawling city and very auto-oriented. However, I want to make note that we have over 400 miles of bike infrastructure and multi-use trails. We have 300 days of sun a year, and so biking and walking is definitely an option in Albuquerque. Um, I also want to make note that we're very multicultural. Um, our history is very interesting, and we have a lot of Native American culture as well as Hispanic and Mexican influence. So it's common to be walking down the street and hear Spanish being spoken. Um, so that was another reason why we wanted to, to dub our, our bike share program BC to kind of uh, show that cultural influence. While it may not rain a lot, it is nice, and there's it's a, an outdoor paradise for people who enjoy climbing, biking, walking, hiking, camping. Um, so it really is a, a diamond in the rough, as I like to say. Hi, and so I work for an organization called Downtown Main Street, and we were formerly the business improvement district for our, our downtown area. And our focus is to bring kind of energized, economic development oriented projects that kind of are created from community initiative to light. Um, and currently we are working on a 2030 district that it has emerged and recently launched. Um, we do a downtown growers market. We do a lot of outreach to our visitors and community as well as kind of um, privately funded infrastructure projects, um, including LED neon signage, wayfinding, things like that. And this is Val, and I work at the Mid-Region Council of Governments. And we also serve as the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Albuquerque Metropolitan Planning Area, as well as the Rural Transportation Planning Organization for the rural are areas outside of the urban areas. Um, while we do serve as the MPO and the RTPO, we also do a lot of work with land use, water, and economic development planning. Um, Mr. Cog, as we lovingly refer to it, is also the home to the Rio Metro uh, Transit District, which has a commuter rail line serving communities south of Albuquerque all the way to Santa Fe. So that's definitely a, a popular mode, and we're going to get into that in a little bit. Um, but we also create our long-range transportation plan, and we really work together regionally to, really, to serve as a forum for local governments to to meet and address different regional issues that we face. So bike share. I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. What is bike share? Um, bike share is essentially a network of bikes and stations that are publicly available for use to run errands, to go to meetings, to meet friends, to go to dinner. Um, but it can also be for recreational or exercise purposes. Bike share is essentially an extension of transit, and it's meant to provide a first and last mile of connectivity, so to fill in gaps where maybe no other transportation mode exists. There was a recent report that came out a couple weeks ago, um, and it said there's 2,655 stations in 65 cities in the United States. And of those bike share stations, 86 Point three, connect to another scheduled public transit mode within a block. And so I just want to make note that you know, bike share, and that's how we 
moving forward with our program and how we anticipate it to grow. Before delving into our bike share program, BC, um, I kind of want to set the stage about you know, where we are in reality, um, the realities that we face. As planners and as community citizens, we live in a world where there's a lot of uncertainty of, about federal level legislation. You know, thankfully, we passed the FAST Act in December, our most recent transportation bill, but in our reality, we lack funding to maintain our existing structure. And these realities can make it really difficult at the local level to think about expensive and innovative projects when we can't even maintain the infrastructure that we have. And so thinking about a bike share program might seem like a pie in the sky idea or something that only the New York Cities or the Chicago's of the world can do. But really, it's possible to get creative at the local level to make these things happen. On top of all of these uncertainties, we're growing. According to the United Nations, over half of our world's population is living in urban areas. And they anticipate that by 2050, 2.5 billion more people will be living on the planet in urban areas. And so when we're thinking about these large-scale numbers, the design of our cities becomes a very critical and key issue to how to move forward for planning locally and regionally. It can also determine economic performance, have environmental implications, impact community health, but also importantly the livability and quality of life components of, every, of our everyday lives. These play big, big, big impacts on that. So one quick question, I know you can't answer me, but I want you to think about what is the largest public space in your community? Well, I'm sure hopefully some of you answered streets. So the, our largest public space is streets. You know, yet for the past 60 plus years, we've designed our cities around cars and the ability to move as many cars as fast as possible from point A to point B. We have essentially designed the people out of our streets. Streets are places where meet friends, business, just walk and bike. There's an interesting video that came from 1906 in San Francisco going down Market Street. And it's just incredible to see this streetcar going down the street where there's horses and bicyclists and pedestrians. And everybody seems to coexist. But you know, today, we live in a world where People don't be walking or biking. We've designed the people out of our streets, and now we have major safety concerns when people can do saving those kinds of activities to get to transit or to walk to the store or to bike to the store. And I want to note that, unfortunately, New Mexico ranks as one of the highest states for pedestrian fatalities per capita. And so that's a reality that we face here. And luckily, we do have a complete streets ordinance that was passed in January of 2015, and it's been really interesting to see that ordinance come into play and in how we're designing our streets locally in an auto-oriented city and try to incorporate more other, other users, the active users, the, the walkers, the bikers. So on top of all this, the millennials are coming. Um, this is Val, and I'm actually a millennial, um, so I'm allowed to make fun of myself, but I always joke that I feel like people always ask me my opinion because they want to study the millennials in their natural habitat. Um, but really, the data and the trends indicate that millennials want livable communities, which means affordability. They want safe, walkable, urban environments where they don't have to go a car to, to run errands, to go meet friends, to go to dinner, to go grab drinks. Or they want to have transportation options that are viable and safe. There's a stat that I read a few years ago about Albuquerque. I haven't seen new data to see if this trend is still true, but Albuquerque is actually losing its millennial population. Um, from 2011 to 2013, we lost 4% of our millennials each year for those three years. And so that's concerning when we think about the future of our community and how we're going to grow and thrive. But really, it's not all about the millennials. Honestly, it is about people. And people want livable communities with transportation options. And mobility preferences are changing, not just millennials, but baby boomers and everybody. So our communities that are investing in providing multimodal options 
These are the places that are thriving, and they're retaining and attracting businesses. They're retaining and attracting people, um, and 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 that's that's the way to move forward. So the communities and the regions that are investing in to retain and attract people businesses by investing in transportation innovations, and one of those is bike share. So we're seeing this all over the world, in the United States and everywhere. Like that statistic I mentioned, there's over 65 cities that have bike share systems now. And I noticed that report was missing actually a few cities. It was missing Albuquerque. It was missing Santa Monica. And so I'd be curious to see that report in a year and how much bike sharing is going to increase from then. So just kind of tying everything together, you know, we've designed our streets for cars. Um, we can't afford to grow in a way where everyone can drive. We need to start investing in alternative active modes of transportation that are safe and reliable and convenient. And so how do we bring more balance to our largest public space, which is streets? And one of the ways is the toolbox to accommodate some of this growth is bike share. Because if we can't even maintain what we have, surely we can't build more. So we need to identify other strategies that can work. And like I mentioned before, it's really, really tricky at the local level to share because we know that it's expensive. You know, systems like in New York, D.C., or Chicago, those are thriving and they're doing really well, but they're very expensive. And for a city like Albuquerque, we don't have the kind of funding mechanism to create a robust network of stations such as those um, at these costs. You know, it's estimated to be forty to fifty thousand dollars a station, as well as five to seven thousand dollars a bike. So systems like these, while they're great and they work in these places, they take years to plan and a lot of capital to implement. But knowing that bike share, you know, is, is growing, how do we identify other mechanisms and strategies? to incorporate it into our urban environments. And so when we're thinking about all of these things, how on earth did downtown Albuquerque get a bike share on the ground in about seven months? And you know, these were a lot of the questions that we processed um, when thinking about this. And we heard a lot from the community that they, the community wanted to see a bike share. Um, and so we had to get creative to make it happen in Albuquerque. So about maybe six months before we started implementing the bike share program, um, our organization puts out, I guess you could say, annual surveys to our downtown businesses, residents, and institutions, asking them what are the top five things that you want to see in your community and what would make your downtown a more attractive place to live, work, and play. And we saw a very high percentage of people indicating that they wanted bike share. So we started to investigate that possibility, and um, the first step was talking to some of our local grantors about potentially um, being involved with us in a very, very small pilot program. Would people even use this? They say they want it, but would they actually use it? As Valerie explained, um, we are kind of an auto-oriented city, um, kind of outside of our downtown, but even within our downtown, um, we have some struggles with how the streets are structured with parking and active use of by buses. And we wanted to make sure that what we were doing wasn't going to put um, people in jeopardy. Um, and we also wanted to find out if this could work long term and if expanded. So we applied for a grant with our local utility company and received it. And it was for not a huge sum of money, only $15,000, but it was enough we thought to at least explore the idea. Even if we had one or two stations, we thought maybe we could indicate a need or not. Um, and what we found out was that as soon as we got the grant, there were a lot of naysayers who said, bike share will never work in Albuquerque. You'll never find funding for it. The bikes will be stolen. Um, we're not a safe enough environment for people to ride their bikes. And realizing that we needed to push innovation as a community we decided that it was important for us to move forward and at least attempt to see what the repercussions or the positive implications could be. Um, upon receiving the grant 
and doing a press release for the fact that we were um, going to be piloting a small program, uh, we started to have folks reach out to us about wanting a station um, within the downtown area. So what started out to be a 5 to 10 bike share station grew to 25 to 30 bikes. Um, and it was all from the community stepping forward to say, whatever this costs, we want to contribute to make this happen. Um, and so then, as we realized that this program was going to be expanding rapidly, um, and still with no vendor in mind, but just the funds were starting to um, compile, uh, we realized we couldn't do this alone. We were not the kind of organization that could implement a bike share program um, that needed to have uh, the support and the dedication of resources in terms of planning, in terms of understanding that our partner the like Mid-Region Council of Governments could provide. And so fortuitously, um, I had been working with, so shout out to Richard Meadows, who is a transportation planner over at Bernalillo County. Um, him and I worked together on our Open Streets event, Sequel Via, and he wanted to write a grant for a bike share program. And so he invited me to help him write that grant, which they were awarded um, for $500,000. So knowing that this pilot is going and knowing that we have funding from the federal level for an expansion, yeah, Lola invited Mr. Cog, like she said, because we have the transportation planning expertise um, to provide maybe a little bit more cohesive of a process to, to move from pilot to a larger program. And a lot of our local government members are very, very interested in bike share. And so it seemed like a natural fit for Mr. Cog to get involved in this project. And luckily, we had visionary leadership here at Mr. Cog that was interested in playing this larger role in um, growing the bike share program and really making it viable. And so we hit the ground running, as they say, and started looking into different vendors. And by January 2015, we had selected Zagster as our bike share vendor and launched on May 15, 2015, which was also National Bike to Work Day. So um, PNM started out as the seed funder, and once it became official that we could actually launch with a selected uh, vendor, the city actually called us up, the city of Albuquerque, and asked if they could participate as they had some destinations that they wanted to, where they wanted to locate a station. Um, and we started to realize that we had a cohesive funding mechanism for this where folks were not only feeling excited about it, but actually wanted to be a partner in it. And these are the list of all the initial businesses that um, provided um, funding um, for the different stations. And they were businesses that ranged from realty firms to restaurants to innovation centers. Uh, to um, housing developments in our downtown area. It was the full range of businesses, and they were doing this not just because they thought that they would personally benefit from the advertising that they would get, but also because they really had a vision for the success of this in the community. And what we've been finding is that when we are doing research about different um, bike sharing programs in other cities that this public-private model seemed to do really well because you know, everybody has some skin in the game. Um, the cost of the share is not solely on the public-private, um, and this creative model would, allowed us to make alliances um, with businesses you know, that we might not have thought of before. Um, and also, it's important to note that you know these stations are are sited on both public and private property, so that's another incentive to to go this route to do the public-private model. Um, and a final statement about the interest of the businesses that's really resonated in our community is that this was the first time where businesses and residents actually felt that they could be a part of setting up a new innovative strategy for how to tackle some of our problems. And they really felt included in this process. They were amazed that they could actually contribute to an infrastructure system that would actually benefit the larger city, but that they could also have a say in it moving forward. And I think it's really resonated 
um, from this point on and much of the work that we're doing in our downtown area, the community feels that they can own this and be a part of this and not just bike share but any of the infrastructure improvements that we start to make. Yeah, and it's really, it's really cool too to see um, there's a neighborhood that's just east of downtown branded as Edo and it was cool to hear them come to us and say they wanted a station but you know they couldn't afford maybe the upfront cost of a, I mean, the pilot year. And so they got creative and, you know, I think they got like eight to ten of their businesses in the same area to contribute. And so that made it possible to have a station in it that wasn't on just one private business. And that was really cool to see. So as I mentioned, you know, we did a lot of research about other bike sharing programs in cities and the public-private model works well because there's benefits for both partners. Um, especially for public partners, you know. Uh, I want to make note of that first and last mile connection. That's huge. And when we are citing these, we'll get to this in a little bit, but we really did try to put them near transit so that a person could potentially hop on the bus, hop off the bus, and there'd be a bike share station right there to complete their trip. Um, it was really interesting, too, excuse me, to see how, um, how the public, I felt like the city felt it was a good opportunity for the private to test this out because the you know constituents can be tricky and um, taxpayer dollars and it allow by allowing us to do this pilot we were able to be a little bit more innovative and try a little bit more different things that were flexible than maybe if the city had rolled it out on their own and so I think it was exciting for the city and the county and our local government members to see it happen in this way um, to kind of really see what works what doesn't work since it is a, a kind of a lighter, quicker, cheaper model and not such a 300 station, 1,500 bikes kind of a model. Um, and we noticed that the businesses, you know, they noticed that it's really good for their customers um, to provide a bike share station outside of their business or near their business. And it's viewed as really environmentally friendly um, and providing that further accessibility to local businesses. And additionally, we're going to generate a lot of data. Um, we're going to get to that in a few more slides, but the potential for generating this kind of data is really incredible to really see where people are walking and biking and where do we need to make future bike and ped infrastructure investments. And I mentioned that Albuquerque is losing its millennials, so maybe bike share is an opportunity to retain and attract more millennials to our region, um, as well as businesses. It, it could provide that opportunity as well. Um, there's a really, really cool article in our local paper here, the Albuquerque Journal, um, and one of the reporters just kind of was waiting by a bike share station until some random user was going to use the bike share station. It was so fortuitous because the gentleman um, was using the bike uh, to go to a meeting. So essentially he checked out the bike and went to another area of town called Old Town, docked his bike, and because he was walking by a business and stopped in and, and bought some souvenir or bought something because he happened to be there. And the reporter asked him if he had been driving, would he have done the same thing? And he said, no, if I had been in my car, you know, I would not have stopped into this business. So it really does create an opportunity for people walking or biking are more likely to stop into local businesses. And Another incentive to the local businesses is these billboards, the plaques that are on the front of the bike baskets, constantly move. And, you know, it's kind of getting your name out there. And it's, a, like we said, it's a very community-driven project. And I think the businesses really saw value in showing their customers and city residents that they value this kind of mode and they want to provide it for people to get around it better. And then at the bottom here are just some stats that we got. We found really interesting about the, you know, the impression value for these kinds of things. I'd be curious to see how much these numbers have ramped up. But when we saw these numbers, um, we're, we're amazed at the potential, the marketing potential. So as I mentioned, we screened multiple vendors. And we chose Zagster because they provided pretty much an, a one-stop shop 
they had the hardware, they had the setup and maintenance, the marketing support, account management. They hired three local people part-time to do the maintenance and redistributions of the bicycling system. They also provide marketing support. Um, one thing when we were going around with different vendors is it looked like we were going to have to start our own organization to be able to have a bike share program. And that just was not a position that we were in. We wanted to pilot this, um, but we, we also needed someone that was going to run it for us. And Dagster stepped up and they were willing to, to really pilot Albuquerque's bike share and work through us with all the quirks and kinks that we encountered along the way. But one thing is it's it's a it's lighter. It's like it's not as as, as robust as like thick the New York Chicago systems where there's the kiosk space and their point to point transportation. Um, you know, this model worked well for us because it was a lot lighter in our community and it fit in quicker. And what was appealing to our vendors was that because the infrastructure for it is more, it's, it's lighter weight and it could be moved very easily if it didn't work for a certain business to have this in front of them, or if we saw that you know it wasn't getting the use that it needed, we were we would be able within a day to move the station to another location, and that was very appealing to um, our vendor, our, our our businesses. And another thing that was really appealing to our businesses because it is a private system. We had to locate it on private property, and we would have to get private access easements. And um, our businesses were willing to do that as long as there was insurance. And um, Zaxter had a $2 million liability policy um, that offered that security to um, all of the business owners who were uh, locating the system on their property. Okay. And so after all of our outreach and finalizing our steps and uh, city support, we ended up with 75 bikes and 15 stations, a lot more than the 5 to 10 bikes initially we thought with the C funding from PNM. And so when we're citing these, there's a, a really interesting statistic um, that Mr. Cog released. Uh, we did a travel survey and found that each weekday there's thousands of trips made under a mile in a single occupancy vehicle. And so our downtown core, you know, it's, it's pretty walkable, very bikeable. It's a grid network, so it's easy to get around. And so we're curious, you know, when we're citing these, are people going to replace car trips with bike trips? You know, that's definitely something we've been thinking about. I mentioned this before, but we really worked towards citing the stations near transit to provide for first and last mile connectivity and in places where there's easy visibility. Um, not only for safety, but also, you know, security of the system. Okay, and so this is some, a GIS map we did with a 1,000-foot buffer. According to some of NACTO, the National Association of City Transportation Officials, they do a lot of bike sharing research, and they recommend walkable station spacing at about a thousand feet or a five minute walk. And so you'll note that there's two points that are kind of not quite connected. One to the south of the map. Um, I guess I can show you with my mouse here. So where my mouse is, this is the National Hispanic Cultural Center. And that's okay because it's a destination and because it's a pilot project, we figured, well, let's try it and see how it works. And then I want to note that there is a really great multi-use paved path that goes even south of here near this ABQ Riverside drain. It's adjacent to this. And if you follow my mouse, it goes all the way along the Bosque, called the Bosque Trail, up here to this other destination that's not quite meeting that 1,000-foot buffer, which is the Albuquerque Botanical Gardens. And so this is um, a station that the city of Albuquerque really wanted to see um, be placed. Same thing, it's a pilot project, and we wanted to, to make it an easy destination. And so, you know, when we're going to be reviewing our expansion, we're going to look at the data and, you know, maybe it's okay that these are not connecting with the 1,000-foot buffer, um, but that they're still easy to access walking or biking. Here's another um, GIS map that we've made. 
Um, here at Mr. Cog, we have a, a, a geographic information system extension, also known as the Transportation Accessibility Model, which we refer to as TRAM. And essentially, that's what this analysis is showing. Light blue shows a five-minute walk within a station, and the dark blue shows a 10-minute walk from within a station. So there's pretty good connectivity along the down, in the downtown core. And this analysis showed that it serves within the 10-minute walking area. 9,433 people live within that dark blue area. And there's 31,434 jobs within that dark blue area. So it's serving a really big percentage of the population within a 10-minute walk. Here is another tram analysis. And this one shows biking. So the light blue is within a five-minute bike ride. And it shows great connectivity with all of the stations. And I want to note that the darker gray lines on this map indicate um, essentially either bike lanes or bike routes or comfortable biking areas. And then the dark blue is within a 10-minute bike ride. And so when we look at this picture as opposed to you know, the 1,000-foot buffer, it's showing that there is pretty good connectivity even though um, it's not meeting the 1,000-foot buffer. And it's interesting to note on this one that within the 10-minute bike buffer, it serves 31,849 people that are living in this area. And there's 50,721 jobs. And so when, we, when Lola and I saw this map, this analysis, you know, we thought, oh, this is probably exactly where everyone is going to ride. Um, why would anyone ride beyond these areas? Because Albuquerque, it's hard to explain, but Albuquerque, where the river is, is the lowest elevation, and downtown is low. And as you move from west to east, the elevation increases. And there's a big hill, and it increases about 200 feet to go from downtown to the adjacent neighborhood, which is the University of New Mexico um, area. And so we didn't anticipate people biking up that hill. Um, we figured they'd stay within the downtown area. Um, but here's a quick snapshot of what actually did happen. Um, this is a screenshot from our data portal, how we track uh, movement with the bikes. And we were amazed and thrilled and so where you see that heart, that's downtown. And so this heat map, is a, it's a heat map essentially, and it shows like the darker red areas are where people are riding the most. And each of those dots the, with the light blue and the green center, that's where someone rode to. <laughs> and I want to show where my mouse is. This is probably an hour to an hour and a half ride from downtown. Um, same thing up here. So it's really incredible to see where people are riding. They're not sticking downtown. They're riding uphill. Um, as I mentioned, um, as I mentioned, from here to about here, it's it goes from about 200 ele 200 feet to 260 feet elevation gain. So that's that's a lot <laughs> to bike. I'm a big biker and bike everywhere. Um, so it's really impressive to see that. And this area in here that also has a, a lot of intensity of use um, is where the University of New Mexico is. Um, and they have a very large student population that lives there. It's our largest university in the state. Yeah, it's definitely a good distinction to make. And you know, that's probably our, our target audience, too. It would be, the as we grow this network, the University of New Mexico students. and um, so. This arrow, or where I'm pointing here, this is our Central Avenue corridor. And a lot of Albuquerque's activity centers, where there's a lot of commercial, um, residential, as well as where people work, are along this corridor. So like Lola mentioned, here's UNM. This is another area called uh, Knob Hill. And so as we grow, we can see already, based on this heat map, where we need to grow. And for context, that corridor is also called Route 66. And so we, really, we receive a lot of visitor traffic along that route as well. Okay, so here's some bike share station examples just to give you a, an idea of what it looks like on the ground. As I mentioned, there's 75 bikes total, 15 stations, and they're sited on public-private property. So moving left to right, the example on the far left is our, our station here at the Mid-Region Council of Governance, Mr. Cog. 
And this is an example of a concrete pad uh, station. So that rock area just had rocks, and we laid a concrete pad, and then the bike racks are anchored into that pad. In the middle, you'll see a fixed system, and that's a public that's at our Albuquerque Convention Center and Civic Plaza. Uh, those are anchored into the concrete. And as Lola mentioned, you know, it's very easy to, to um, uninstall these and move them a, a foot or two feet. There was actually one we had at the city planning office that we had to move over a few feet um, after launching the program, but it wasn't a big deal to move. And then the example on the far right, this is a freestanding bike rack. And so essentially it's really, really heavy. Um, it would take someone a lot of feet of strength to move this thing. So there's different options, um, which was really attractive to our community. Since this is a pilot, it's not so infrastructure heavy. And so because the model that we chose was more affordable, we were able to get creative with our pricing. Um, and that was another attractive um, thing for our community. So we wanted to make it very affordable. So a one-year membership was $25, which is less than the cost of a pass, which was a goal. And do unlimited 30-minute increments of time um, from kiosk to kiosk. But we wanted to try something different, so we went for 90 minutes free every day just to see what would happen. Um, so it's unlimited 90 minutes free each day, uh, $15 for a month membership or $3 for an hour. And we'll look at that data a little bit later um, to show the breakdown of how people are using the system. So. We've mentioned that this, this model is a little bit lighter and less invasive than the kiosk-based systems in other larger cities. Um, and it's really interesting because each bike comes with its own U-lock. So it, it creates an a opportunity for people to stop mid-trip. They don't have to go from point to point. Um, as long as when they're done using the bicycle, they return it to a station, then that's totally fine. Another really great thing about this model is that Users do not have to have a smartphone to use the system. Each sign has a number that a user can text to start their ride, which will send them a code. They enter that code on the lockbox on the bike. They open that lockbox, and there's a key that will unlock and lock the, the, the lock for the bike. So if you want to stop mid-trip, you would use the same code to get the key back out. Um, and then when you're done, you end your ride via text or via the smart app. And same thing, the, the bikes are a little bit different than what you might be used to seeing in other cities. It's a, a lightweight cruiser. It's light enough that a user could potentially put it on the front of a bus if they were going a really long distance and needed a bike. The seat's adjustable. There's seven gears, um, fenders to keep, uh, keep people's pants clean. Um, it's, it's a cool bike. Um, it's actually the same bike my mom has. And so... I knew it was like, if my mom can ride this bike, then I think anyone can ride this bike. And as when we were initially surveying the community about what their concerns were with moving forward with a bike share, um, one of the big concerns was actually having a bike that was not too heavy, because if there was interest in um, climbing our area hills, um, it had to be a lighter weight bike. So when we talked to different vendors, that was our question, how heavy is your bike? Um, it was interesting. The, the weight differences were substantial. And in our kind of hillier um, topography, that wasn't going to work for us. OK, now for the exciting nerdy planner stuff, which I love, is the data. So here is that heat map again, showing you where all of our writers have ridden since May 15th, 2015 to current. So far, we've had over 4,734 trips, over 887 users. And here's a really interesting factoid. Our average trip duration is an hour and 34 minutes, which means that people are using more than their free 90 minutes each day, which is incredible um, and has been very positive. And one thing that's interesting looking at this data is you can tell exactly where we need stations, where there aren't any. Um, and hopefully this data can help us identify common bike routes, 
um, and identify areas for future bike ped infrastructure improvements. So another thing that the data kind of clarified for us was this chicken and egg scenario that we had been battling here in Albuquerque, which was, do you launch a bike share system if you don't have the infrastructure, or do you wait until you have the infrastructure before you launch? And what we realized was that this was our opportunity to push the envelope, showing the need data. We can now make those infrastructure to these areas of the that we're seeing in the heat map. Um, and so our new our members and our counselors was that, look, we've proven that this can work now. We need to help support the infrastructure to make this really safe and really accessible. And um, we finally were able to resolve that chicken and egg for our community. And here's a, a little bit more data about from May 15th to November 15th, which is the first six months of our program. Half of our youth from New Mexico and the other half are from outside. And so, you know, that's kind of interesting as we market this for, for future is that, you know, it's a great tourism opportunity, but not only for our residents, but for people visiting our region. And we found that, I mentioned that you can use text messaging to check out the bikes. So 95% of the people use a smartphone and 5% use text. And so we thought that was really cool that that was a way you can check in and check out the bikes. And hopefully that would encourage other users that might not normally, you know, be comfortable using a smartphone to, to use the system. So everyone always asks us, how does Albuquerque compare to New York? <laughs> how does Albuquerque compare to Chicago? Well, honestly, we don't, you know. Um, it's really hard to compare apples to oranges. Um, but we do know because people are using it. And we've been hearing from, we hear from people today how positive this, this program is and how happy people are to see it. And here's some, you know, some screenshots of different um, media that we've seen online that really promotes how positive people feel about this program. Um, well, I remember if Lois mentioned this, but when we were working on launching this program, almost every single person we encountered said that the bikes are going to be stolen. And if we had a dollar for every time we heard that, we'd probably be millionaires. Um, and we're happy to report that none of our bikes have been stolen. Um, unfortunately, there's been a few, um, you know, some vandalism to our Mr. Cog station. But honestly, nothing crazy terrible has happened in our program. And so we feel like that's a huge measure of success as well as ownership of the community loving this program and wanting to see it be a success. And our sponsors have indicated that they're interested in continuing supporting this program, which is also very, very positive. And Lola and I, between the two of us, we've probably received 100 calls from different communities across the United States that wanted to know how we did it, you know, what worked, what didn't work, what would we do differently. Um, so obviously we're on to something good. Um, we feel like we are. Um, it's, a, it's a great pilot program. And I want to make a note that, you know, by by framing it as a pilot, we were able to generate the support and the constituency um, and the demand, where the community was demanding that this program grows. Um, whereas I don't know if it would have been quite as successful had it not been community driven. And so we've done some due diligence. We've gone to a lot of public meetings. We've gone to a lot of events really and brought map people, hey, put a dot on the map. Where would you like to see bike share? Where do you want to see BC grow? And so we had a survey that was open for about three months and asked people for specific locations of where they would like to see it. And so I took that data and put it into GIS and created this map. And so those kind of pink purple uh, dots showing our downtown core, our existing stations, and these green dots distributed along the central corridor, also Route 66, as Lola mentioned, um, is showing where the community is demanding to see it grow. And so it's in line with where people are riding. It's in line with the heat map data of where people are going. These are our city's activity centers. And so it makes sense to grow them um, to these areas because they are walkable, bikeable activity centers that have very good access to transit. And so these cluster of dots is the University of New Mexico, 
adjacent to there, these cluster of dots is a neighborhood called Knob Hill. And up here is another cluster of dots called Uptown. And so these are all very viable areas where we could see the program growing. And we're anticipating continuing this kind of outreach and feedback um, to see where people would like to see the program. Okay, so next steps, you know, how do we get from downtown to here? We know where people are going. We know that's where people are demanding to see the program grow. Um, so how do we get there? You know, since day one, Lolan, I've been working with the city as well as, you know, Mr. Cog's local government members to identify a way to make this permanent and to identify a permanent home um, for an organization that wanted to grow it. Um, we've gone through so many different scenarios. We looked at potentially starting a nonprofit. We looked at maybe the different main streets in Albuquerque could have an ownership role. Um, maybe the city would want it. Um, but honestly, it was really tricky navigating it because, you know, downtown Main Street is focused on downtown, and Lola can speak a little bit more to that. But we worked really hard to try and identify who. And I think it took us going full circle through all of these different options because ironically, or maybe not ironically, we ended up right back at Mr. Cog. And so Lola and I approached the Rio Metro Regional about taking on this program because one of their missions is to manage a regional, integrated, multimodal public transportation network that's fiscally responsible, innovative, and efficient. And one of their primary missions is creating that first and last mile of connectivity, not only for the community, but for residents. And it also made sense, too, because they have the commuter rail line, as I mentioned before, that services communities just south of Albuquerque in Valencia County to Albuquerque and all the way up to Santa Fe. So the people that live in one community and work in another. And so bike share is an opportunity to, to further improve people's transportation choices. And so Rio Metro uh, approved bike share, adding it to their program in February 2016. And so the next step with that move is because there are federal dollars, we're required to go to request for proposal. So we'll go to RFP. And the idea is to move beyond downtown and to create a regional bike share. So we're not only looking at we're also looking at Santa Fe and utilizing the existing public-private model that, we, that has worked so well here. And so this really does create an opportunity to create a very robust transit network in central New Mexico. Um, where people don't have to get into a car if they don't want to. And so we've been working with, I um, want to give a shout out to Eric Ani from Santa Fe Metropolitan Planning Organization. Lola and I met with him last summer, you know, hey, just kind of touch base. Would Santa Fe be interested in bike share? Because we saw the opportunity of having a membership that worked in both cities. It just made the most sense. And so he's really spearheaded the project up there, and it's moving forward um, very quickly. And so stay tuned to the news about um, the regional bike share for central New Mexico. And so I mentioned that we released a survey for three months to get community feedback. And we've been trying to do our due diligence to go to different community meetings and events and present at local conferences about this program to really hear how people feel about it and how they want to see it grow. Um, these are just some screenshots from different um, social media pictures of people you know, tagging the bike share program. Um, and then that top uh, right photo is a block party event that we had a booth at where we had big maps and had people put dots on a map of where they would like to see the program grow. And so we just really want to involve the community since this project was so community driven and it would not have happened if the community hadn't stepped up and demanded that it grow. So we want to make sure to include them still. Um, I just want to make note of the bottom left photo. Some put you are beautiful stickers into the key boxes of some of the bikes. And I just thought that was just really, really sweet. Um, and it made me smile. So I wanted to include that photo. 
So we're currently developing siting criteria um, you know, that can work here. I know that NACTO is going to be releasing their bike share station siting guide pretty soon, and we're anxious to, to review that. We've been looking at other cities' siting criteria. Um, the top right is a poster that we had at different community events so that people take into consideration um, different components when siting these stations. Um, you know, as we mentioned, they go on both public private property. The public um, sightings required an encroachment agreement, and the private property required an easement. And so, you know, it's definitely tricky and it takes time navigating these things, but it's not impossible. And one thing that has come up in our community is that, and one of the reasons we have to develop these criteria, besides the fact that they make sense for planning the system, is that we are getting a lot of interest from property owners and business owners in areas of our city that are maybe are not as well connected. And so we want to have clearly set criteria so that they understand our objectives and potentially why we have to kind of refuse their siting location at this time or in the near future until there's a comprehensive network that covers a much larger area um, of our city, not just along our main transit corridors. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I, I don't know if everybody knows, but nobody died on and create a situation um, for novice riders to be riding in really unsafe places. So luckily people have been pretty understanding about how we would like to site our stations. And so based on that community feedback and the heat map and basically all of the data of everything, we created this proposed BC bike share station map. And this just shows that 1,000 foot buffer to give you an idea. Um, but it goes along the oops, goes along this uh, this is the central Route 66 corridor here, and recently Albuquerque um, passed or the city council approved accepting federal dollars to do an improved rapid transit bus line, Albuquerque Transit, also known as ART or ART, and so we've really been working closely with their team to try to site these near those stations to really improve access and mobility options for people. Um, I did a tram analysis on this map, which is the transit access um, widget that goes within our GIS. And with this current, with this map, with these proposed stations, within a 10-minute walk, it would serve 32,000 people, and it would reach 88,675 jobs. And within these stations, a 10-minute bike ride, it would serve 118,749 people living within one of these stations. And it would support 170,000 jobs. And so it's, it, I'll be really curious when we grow the network to see that heat map blow up even more. Um, it's going to be really encouraging. And just knowing that we're serving a lot more people by expanding the system. And then we're also working towards citing them at these activity centers and destinations as I mentioned, the University of New Mexico and not So this is definitely always a hot topic. Um, I can't think of one meeting where this did not come up. And these are some you know, headlines that I see in the news. We definitely do our research and read all the articles and try to stay in the loop with you know, what are other cities doing to address these equity issues. It's something we're very concerned about, and it's something that we want to make sure to have an answer for. Um, we, a lot of people were concerned that not having a cell phone was an issue, um, but we've, what we found is that it, most people actually do have a cell phone. Um, interestingly enough, our healthcare providers in our state, if you are receiving Medicaid benefits, will actually offer you a free um, cell phone in case you need to access you know, family or for health purposes. So the issue has not been um, access to a cell phone. It, the issue has actually been, as, and it is in most communities, access to credit. Um, because to become a member, you need to have a credit card. And so um, we are going to be working with uh, one of the local credit unions that has a full arm to develop a credit program um, so that without credit, can participate in this. So we're really hoping to, you know, to address that. And I feel like we found a, a pretty positive solution in growing our system. It's definitely on our radar. 
And of course, what everyone wants to know is, how are you going to pay for this? Um, so we're, we're hoping to continue the public-private model. As I mentioned, we have the TAP grant, which is going to help us buy a lot of the capital for the stations. And then what we're hoping is that the private, private business sponsorships, as well as multiple corporate sponsorships, can help to pay for the rest. And we also you know, didn't want to rely on one sole corporation. Um, we like the idea of maybe, you know, PNM is located downtown. Maybe they can be the downtown corporate sponsor. There's a, a healthcare provider uh, east of downtown named Presbyterian. Maybe Presbyterian can be the Edo corporate sponsor. So the idea is to try to get as many different entities involved so that the burden and the cost is not on one entity. And right now it looks like the financing of it will roughly translate into thirds. So a third of the funding could come from local business sponsorships, a third of it could come from corporate, and then a third of it would come from little uh, which would actually contribute to the capital. And even though our program is, you know, only $25 for a year, we did, you know, when, um, with the Zagster model, all of the money that the Bike Share program makes goes back to, to Lola's the, organization. Right, it goes back to the system. And so what we found is it's roughly 10% of the investment that we made into it. And so that'll be a key number as the system grows to continue to support the system. Okay, that's our presentation. And thank you and happy to answer questions. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Christine. Great, thank you. <clears throat> okay, um, we do have some questions here. Um, in your research for models, did you find any examples from suburban communities less than 100,000 population? Um, you know, actually, we actually believe that we were the research model because as much as we consider ourselves urban, we're a pretty suburban style of community. We have a downtown core, but it's, there's a lot of vacancy in our core. We have a lot of vacant buildings that were torn down. Um, during the urban renewal era. And so we, there is an effect where we don't have a high density of population in our downtown area, so we actually would probably fit a more standard density level of a suburban community. But um, as much research as we did, we couldn't find it, and that was one of the concerns that folks had was that we didn't have the density to justify it. But interestingly enough, in the last year, many of the phone calls we've received have been from suburban communities, including um, several suburban communities in Florida, and we can give you kind of contact information to see who they are, but they are going to be launching their own systems in kind of a suburb of Orlando, a suburb of Sarasota, and then one, uh, I think, in southern Florida. Um, and then we've been in discussion with folks in Colorado and some of the more suburban communities there. And the nice thing about the lighter, quicker, cheaper model that um, some vendors are providing, like Zagster, I think there's others that are now out there in the market, is that the, it, the intensity of use isn't needed to justify it. Um, so even if we have you know, 10, 15 users a day at a certain site, the cost was low enough that that's OK. Other sites are doing really well, and they help balance it. Um, so we had no one to look to specifically, and that's one of the reasons why we considered ourselves to be that pilot for that model. Okay, great. Um, can children use the bike shares? And in your research, did you find any bike shares that allow children to use the system in, in other places? Um, so actually, most cities that we came across, you have to be 18 and over. It's, it, it's a big liability thing. However, um, Zexter is coming out with a new model, and it has little side carriages with the bicycles. Um, and I, I'm not sure of the communities that are going to be piloting that or how it's going to work, but I know it's definitely a question we get a lot is, you know, why can't my kids ride this? And uh, interestingly enough, Zagster is really responsive because their target is the smaller community. Um, and looking at not just a, a bike that has a trailer, essentially, for folks who want to bring their children along or a sidecar model or an extension model for the older um, 12 to 15 something, but um, they're also looking at bikes that potentially is, are easier for seniors to ride, so the three-seater models of bikes. I'm um, not three-seater, I'm sorry, three-wheel 
spikes. Um, so they get it and they hear it, and I think a lot of the bike share programs are trying to start to respond to the different needs of the biking community. But it is a big miss right now, and we did get some initial complaints that you had to be 18 to ride the system. <laughs>